Hello and welcome to the Rogue Monkey podcast. My name is Kevin Pickard. Welcome back to the show that challenges convention, shares stories of those questioning the status quo and hopefully inspires you to take positive action in your life. If you're not already following us, make sure you give us a quick follow across the various social media platforms. Just search for the Rogue Monkey podcast. Thank you for all the great feedback following last week's episode with Richard Cheatham, MBE. If you're yet to check that one out, please make sure you head back and give it a listen as it really was an inspiring conversation. And speaking of inspiring conversations this week, we are interviewing former All-American swimmer, TV presenter and author Kate Ekman. Over the next half an hour, we explore Kate's journey, the stories that led to her creating her new book. And I promise you, if you're in need of a boost today, this conversation is exactly what you need. Kate's energy is infectious from the off and it was super fun to record this interview and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. So without further ado, let's get into it and episode 45 of the Rogue Monkey podcast. Kate Ekman, becoming the best version of you. Hello Kate, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks for sharing some time with us. Just to get us started, if you can give our listeners just a quick introduction as to who you are and your headline journey so far. Sure. So I am a woman who was really into athletics my whole life, and I was a 17-year competitive swimmer and swam all through college. And athletics has always just been at the core of who I am and those, um, you know, building those strong physical muscles. And then I worked as a, a professional model and TV presenter and um, TV news anchor and reporter covering all the death and destruction <laughs> in the world and transitioned into presenting on QVC, which you have there in the UK and selling beauty products, which was a refreshing change of pace from all the doom and gloom. And I, I've now just transitioned into being an executive leadership coach. Coach and I work with professional athletes on performance and business leaders and, and just really helping people be successful in the outside world, of course, but more feeling successful on the inside and really redefining what success means. And so that led me to my book journey as, you know, being a, a journalist my whole life and, and writing so many articles, I decided to write a book, which is um, a big undertaking. I, I relate it to being a parent or getting a face tattoo. You know, it's a, it's a commitment. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. And you really have to have a, a strong why. And I, I certainly have a strong why in this, in this project. But yeah, I'm just at the heart of all of it. I'm just a, a person who loves to deeply connect with others. And so I appreciate you having me on your show and hopefully able to connect with you and your listeners in a meaningful way. For sure. And I think that, I mean, there's so many avenues we can start going down already just on that introduction there. But I'm curious, going all the way back to the, the sports world when you were, you know, still at college and high school, because, you know, you say to a 15, 16 year old, want to be what do you want to be when you're older? Usually where you are now is probably not what will come out of your mouth. So what, going back to kind of your sports journey, what was the vision? Where did it all start for you? Yeah, that's interesting. I just swimming gave me a spirit of excellence. So I don't do anything halfway. But even as an athlete and, and growing up, I grew up in a household with Tom Brokaw, the NBC news anchor on every night. And I was just fascinated by him because I thought how cool to just tell stories and let us know what's going on with other people. And then I would go up to my bedroom and, and read the news to my stuffed animals and I would just make it all up. And so it just got my curious brain going and just just, again, wanting to connect, even if it's just with the stuffed animals and always wanting to inform people and educating myself and then letting everybody know what I've learned. So sports then just gave me that, that real, that drive to just do whatever I, I wanted to do. And I think my message in, in my career, I feel like a cat who's had nine lives and that whatever you can at, you know, out of college, I talked to a lot of college kids and they're so stressed out thinking that what they decide to do right out of college, they have to stick with forever. And I don't subscribe to that. I think you can change your mind at any time and, and change directions. And, and what I will say too, is that nothing is wasted. So I look at all the experience, even working as a model and being able to just show up and, and, project a lot of energy, even when you're tired and being a presenter, just being able to talk and answer questions then as an author. So everything that you do in life builds upon itself, even if it doesn't feel like it at the time. So let's go back to some of those early experiences, because the book for me feels like a kind of 
the world's coming together of all the different strands of your life and those lessons learned and actually let's explore some of those experiences that shaped that because it wasn't a nice straight line where everything went harmoniously and there was no stresses and issues at all you know it sounds like you've had quite an up and down journey in some of the challenges you've had so what were some of the standout memories and experiences that kind of shaped where you are now? Yeah, I think having a forward facing career on camera and being in the public where people feel that they have the right to just rip you to shreds and say such negative things about you, like you aren't a human being yourself. And they do it from the comfort of their own homes hidden behind a computer. I don't know that they would necessarily say it to your face. So I think having working in TV as a model and presenter, it brought up every insecurity I knew I had and several I had no idea that I had. But I'm grateful for that because, you know, when we're triggered and and we're dealing and battling through self-doubt and insecurities, they come up as a detox. So we can acknowledge them, release them, and then come up with a new way of living. And and that's what I've done in this book. But I think that, I think losing two dear friends to suicide in one year certainly rocked me to my core And, and not just dealing with grief and the loss of two beautiful people, but what their deaths brought up in me and, and looking at how, I, like many, was placing so much of my worth in the externals, you know, how much money I make, what I look like, are, are people impressed with what I'm doing, all those things that that is in our culture, especially in America, and really having to examine how I was choosing to live my life. And so those were a few things that really just woke me up. You know, there's no more pretending or denying after something like that. And then really getting to the core of who I am and and what I really want. And as I'm working with so many people, even some of the most successful people out in the material world, they really have no idea who they are or what they really want because they're just going on this program that society has kind of given them that they've adopted as their own. So I think this book, I want to, you know, shake things up. I, I consider myself a bit of a status quo disruptor and really get to the core of of who you are and and what you really want and spending some time in that space, even if it's super uncomfortable. So we talk about experiences, I guess, there of being uncomfortable and shaking things up a little bit. Back in Chicago, I believe you had an interview a few years ago that probably introduced you to somebody who was going to go on and do kind of that on a global scale. Don't know if you want to share that story. Absolutely. So I was in journalism school at Northwestern, which is in Chicago, and it was just another day and we were going to um, an event and I got to interview at the time, Senator Barack Obama, um, the Illinois Senator. And I I will never forget that interview. First of all, I'm laughing because (laughs) it's like two inches from my face. I mean, just right up in my face. It was kind of a crowded thing. But I remember right afterwards, I text my mom and I said, I just interviewed the most brilliant person I have ever interviewed. He was just, and as you know, just extremely well-spoken and charming. And I just remember being so blown away by him and his professionalism. And as someone who speaks publicly, I thought, gosh, he's raised the bar for me in terms of just he just nails it. And he's very um, convicted in what he's saying and um, committed to, to doing good in the world. So, and he just has a presence. I talk about presence so much when I talk about building your confidence, that man has presence. So I think it's something, again, I love meeting people like that because um, it shows you what's possible for you in terms of showing up in the world and how you want to show up. And then, you know, I just, I just, this just came to mind as I'm talking last president's day. So in February, just weeks before international lockdown, I was staying with a friend in Rancho Mirage, California, Palm Springs, and went to the little gym in the morning at this community. (laughs) I walk in and it was all the secret service. And I thought, what is going on? But Barack Obama, President Obama, and all of the Secret Service were in this little country club gym with a few of us other people. And I was lifting weights and doing TRX next to President Obama and the Secret Service and on President's Day. And it was just such a cool memory. And I'm glad I have that. That was my last trip (laughs) I've taken since COVID. So what a great way to to go out, right? (laughs) I find that fascinating because, you know, most people would never have those experiences and be able to share not just those, but many of the stories that you do in the book. So there must have been a tipping point where 
you, we talked a lot already about this kind of not being judged by externals and external values and those sorts of things. There must have been a tipping point where you pulled on all these experiences and said, actually, I'm going to turn it on its head and view things in a slightly different way. Can you remember across your career when that actually happened? Yeah, I think it was it was gradually building. And for me, I I just had a full on panic attack in the middle of Times Square, Manhattan, which is <laughs> horrible place to have a panic attack. Um, so I, that was kind of the, okay, something is not working here. And um, fortunately, my brother is a physician and I write about it in the book and I'm, I'm so glad. And that's a message to everyone to reach out for support and help. I think sometimes we think we have to do it on our own or people will judge us if we're having a, a dark moment or in a dark place. But people want to help. I, people will stop what they're doing and assist you and be there for you. So I, I think for me, just packing my schedule and being that hamster on the relentless wheel and not giving myself the appropriate time to grieve or to rest or to take time off in the name of making it happen and being successful and making the money and keeping up in a city and a career like in New York and, and being a model and presenter. So I, I think it's it's just a nod to take care of yourself before you reach that breaking point. And there's no shame in that. And actually resting and taking time off and doing nothing is actually achieving a lot. You're you're achieving inner peace and and connecting with your inner wisdom. And so I think people think you have to just go, 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 go and make it happen. But really you're going to quote unquote, make it happen a lot more easy, easier and more efficiently when you give yourself the proper time to just chill out. We were talking a bit before we started recording about how bizarre the last 12 months has been. And I think how, how many, how many people around the world have had some time in the last year to actually take stock stand there and just reflect a little bit potentially rebalance their lives a little bit and the book's quite a timely reminder of actually the importance of doing that yeah I I, I this quote always comes to mind from Blaise Pascal that says all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone and we saw that play out this past year when you couldn't just be distracted by endless possibilities and things and you had to sit with yourself and how uncomfortable that can be. And I'm not, a, I'm not above that. It's uncomfortable for me at times too. But the more I've gotten practice at just, I call it sit and stare time. I sit, I stare out the window, I stare straight ahead, but I allow myself to process what the heck is going on and just reflect, you know, how are you? What's working? What do you need right now? It's almost speaking to yourself the way you would your child or, or just a, a younger person that you just love and adore and want to nurture and care for and, and really taking that time. And, and what I'm finding is I've become more practiced at listening and my sit and stare time. I get the guidance and inspiration in terms of what action steps to take or, or, and then I find I just, I don't even have to try. I get the phone calls. I get the emails. I get the opportunities, but you also just feel better because you're, you're present in your body. Um, I'm an emotional eater. So that's certainly something that could come up many times this past year, but it's just, I ask myself, are you hungry for food or are you hungry for love or affection or something else? And so asking ourselves these questions. And, you know, I even do this with clients, especially men, you can see the look on their face. They're so uncomfortable, but then once you do it, they just, I'm like, oh my gosh, this stuff works. So I just invite everyone to try. And when you are, whether forced or, or not to take that sit and stare time and really just connect with yourself. And, you know, we get so upset when others don't see us or hear us or acknowledge us, especially our partners. But then think about how many times you don't see or hear or even acknowledge yourself. One thing that I'm really curious about, because the, the world has become more and more and more commercialized and superficial. At the same time, you've effectively gone on a journey that's taken you away from that. So there must have been some conflict and some some butting of heads even if it was internally to kind of say hold on this doesn't conform to what the rest of the world is telling me how did you navigate that yeah that thing that's a great question because this whole book and all the work that I do is really a, a 180 degrees away from the thinking of the world that says it's all about 
what you look like and how much money you make and how many likes you have and how many followers you have. And just it's, ugh, it has that real ick factor, right? And then it sets us up for failure. We can never have enough or be enough. And research even indicates that, that, you know, all you want, for example, is I want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year or pounds or euros or squid, whatever everyone calls it. Um, and then you reach that level and you're happy for 15, 20 minutes. And then you're like, well, I need to make at least 250 a year, or <clears throat> I have my beautiful three bedroom house. Well, now I'm only going to be happy if it's the six bedroom house. And it sounds absurd as I say it, but we've all been there. And it's that, you know, just, you have to be, or have and do and be more and more and more. And so we don't even enjoy what we have in the present moment. And I think for me, it just, it does feel good to move away from all of the externals and just being so comfortable in your own skin and with yourself that, you know, I say to people too, I have a lot of friends that work in sports or clients that work in sports and they'll suffer big losses. And, you know, people are saying nasty things about them on social media. And I go into protective mama bear mode because I love them. They're friends, they're clients. And I, I will say to them, you know, the truth of who you are, your spirit can never be criticized or rejected. And they all say, amen. And I think that's something you need to, I need to repeat again. So the truth of who you are, your spirit can never be criticized or rejected. You may not like my hair. You may not like my voice. You may not like my book, what it, but it, it doesn't matter because who we really are is pretty flawless and perfect and doesn't matter what people think. So it is, again, it is a practice, but dwelling in that space and coming back to that because it is really easy to be offended or <clears throat> taken off course by some nasty comments, even if they're, you know, nasty comments from yourself. This is very true. And I think I, I listen to a lot of different interviews of sports people who say, you know, you see a lot of them actually coming off social media because they say, I get 5,000 wonderful comments and one nasty one. And that's the one that sits with me. And yet they've done some, whether it's in their sports world or their uh, other stuff, they actually feel like it just completely knocks them off balance. And you say, well, don't look at it then, you know, get come off it. Yeah. And, or some people, I, I do have a lot, of, I have a, had a lot of people say to me, cause I've spoken very openly about this soon about being, you know, publicly body shamed. And I have people who say, well, why is someone like you concerned about what some jerk says or whatever on some troll says? And I see what they're saying. Um, I am human. I am not an enlightened master. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working my way to becoming more and more enlightened, but it does, it does affect you and you can look away and it affects me less and less because I have practiced, but I think it's just, it's hurt. I hurt for that person too, that you have so much self-hatred and are in such a bad place in your life that you think it's okay to not just think that, but say that about somebody you don't know. And I think with the athletes, I laugh because <laughs> I'm just thinking here, let's say LeBron James, like one of the greatest athletes of all time. And someone in the peanut seats who can't even dribble a basketball is criticizing <laughs> his performance. So it's laughable. Um, but I think things have gotten really ugly. And that's why this sit and stare time and this, this inner journey is so important because it can take you out. And Everyone has a mission here. You don't have to be LeBron James or B President Obama or, or whatever, but everyone is gifted. Everyone has talents they need to share with the world. And when we're wrapped up in the trolls and what other people are saying about us, as you know, it takes you out and you're not showing up and sharing your gifts. So if nothing else, if you can't do it for yourself, do it for all the people who need your work and need your love and need your, your energy and presence. I remember listening to a, a really good presentation from a, an Olympic coach we've got in this country called Mel Marshall uh, about five, six years ago. And she stood up after her swimmer had won his first Olympic title and said something to the effect of every single person in the room and every athlete that you look after will have their own Olympics. It might not be the Olympics, but there will be something that they are good at, that they are working towards, and you can help them on that journey. And too often, I think we get caught up in the, the race to the top, whatever the top even is. And actually, you miss out on all the stuff in between. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the book today, but actually we've explored so many things that have little pieces of experiences across your life. And too often we gloss over all of that and go, yeah, but, you know, where did you get to? How big's your house? Um, and I mean, there's one thing that actually is quite timely because I've just, I have to send it to you. I've just uh, finished reading a book um, by a guy called Stephen Bartlett, who works in a social media marketing agency. And he was talking about a piece of research 
where they interviewed, I think it was about a thousand people. And the minimum criteria for inclusion is that your net worth was a million dollars. And they asked each of them where they were on the happiness scale. And none of them said 10. And then they said, what would you need in your career to get to a 10? And irrelevant of whether they earn a million or a hundred million, they all said three times more than what they've got. And it, you, they got suckered into that world of external clarification. It's really, really interesting piece of work. Wow. I just got the goosebumps because I did that very similar research and it, it was the, the same thing where even all the things that we think are going to make us happier, the money, if you're a student, good grades, good looks, good looking partner, being married in general, all of these things that our culture tells us. And when they do the research, and this is years and years of research by tons and tons of people, what, what we have found is that none of this, none of that changes our baseline happiness. That's the sad news. The good news is that there are things that are proven to give you the happiness boost. And most of them are free acts of kindness, acts of service, um, savoring the act of savoring. So not just rushing through your meal or like, Oh yeah, that's a nice sunset, but actually taking the time to appreciate the sunset. You get more boosts of confidence and happiness. If you share it with someone savoring your morning espresso or, or your, you know, for me, I love all my pizza and pasta and gelato. I'm a wannabe Italian. And it's, so it's, it's things like that. The gratitude I talk about in the book. It's one of my favorite things I wrote about the, the gratitude visit and right now, even just doing a virtual one, but thinking of someone who has dramatically improved or transformed your life and writing them a 300 word gratitude letter and then reading it to them face to face, even if it's over zoom and just how that increases your happiness level just for you and the other person more than any amount of money or success in the outside world can do. And it has lasting effects. And I did it. And, and I agree. And, and Martin Seligman, the, the founder of positive psychology created that exercise. So it's all these things. And even I can, I can even hear or feel listeners like, yeah, yeah, that's nice, but I want more money. You know, I want the, the and I get it. I like nice things. I want to go on the fancy vacations and all those things are great, but I've noticed that too, for myself, I'll even reach success or I will, I will get really big goals and I'm, it's cool, but I noticed that, yeah, I'm proof. Like my baseline happiness doesn't really change, but when I'm even this conversation, you are a stranger an hour ago. I feel more lit up having conversations like this than when I get a big deal. See, and I'm, I'm processing in real time here. And I'm like, that's, that's the truth. And it's, it's kind of fascinating. So you've got, obviously you've had all these experiences, but <clears throat> as we talked about earlier, that there's a lot of work that goes into a book. So at what point did you actually, or was it somebody said something to you or, you know, how did it get to a point that you actually went, right, I'm going to take the time to pull all of these lessons together and share it in a way that's going to help other people uh, and not just their, you know, it, oh, here's a book, it, you know, it's nice. And there's a little bit of a story told, you know, real stuff. Just, I mean, I reading through it felt like I was going to the gym, but in terms of the way that, you know, that was it. It felt like a mind workout, but for your body. And it's, it's how did you get to that point? Yeah. So I, and I talk with a lot of people because I feel like everyone and their sister <laughs> tells me they want to write a book and I think great, but you know, they've never written an article. I know that writing is not their passion. And if you are going to take something like this on, you have to have a strong why. And my why were, you know, was, is my friends, Sam and Roth, who are no longer with us. And I wanted to give people hope in a very beautiful, but chaotic and uncertain world. I wanted people to have the tools to truly transform their lives and get the results that I've gotten. My clients have experienced and, you know, the tried and true methods. And I studied my butt off and did all the nerdy academic research <laughs> because I'm a nerd, but I, I wanted I know when I'm struggling and I'm going through things that that means so many others are too. And that's evidence when you do an Instagram post and you get a hundred comments like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And I think, yeah, I know. Cause I needed to hear it. And they, they say you teach what you need to learn, but I had a strong why with, um, ded and dedicating the book to these friends. And I just, I hate that feeling of feeling alone, which I think we've all experienced, especially this past year. And so I wanted people to have a place, have a book, have this outlet where they could feel connected. Most importantly, 
to themselves. And, um, I just believe in people so much. And I just feel like I'm surrounded by people who are filled with self-doubt and insecurity and anxiety. And I see children taking all this medication and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I think that there are other ways to really, um, live a life that we truly love and, and not just say that, and we all understand it intellectually, but we really feel that in our bones and we live it every day. So I guess implement a lot of the things you talked about. There is a degree of ownership. You know, people have to make the choice to both read it, absorb it and, and apply it. So where did that lesson of ownership come from? Because, you know, we've already talked about the sports background and stuff like that. But a lot of the opportunities and we'll say luck, but it's not luck. It's hard work that you've had across your career will have come down to the fact that you've taken ownership over a, a route to a job or a route to a swimming competition or whatever it is. And then actually now you're applying that and saying, look, if you want to be successful, happy, whatever you define that as, it's you that's got to, you know, do the heavy lifting. Yeah. I mean, look, there's no substitute for hard work. You have to, it's like going to the gym and your personal trainer can be the best trainer in the world, but he or she cannot do your push-ups and your sit-ups and your pull-ups for you. That's on you. And it starts with your willingness. So I, I like to say our good intentions are not enough. Our willingness is everything. You have to be willing to show up. And that's the first step. And you know that when you go to the gym, oh my gosh, I'm out of shape. I'm next to all these six packs and i been drinking beer for months, you know, but being willing to show up and not be great at first or even ever, but you're showing up. And I think that, you know, my, my swim coach, Larry Lyons would talk about how there's thoroughbreds and there's plow horses. And it sounded funny, but he would even say that obviously the champion is going to be the thoroughbred who trains like a thoroughbred, but he would say the plow horse who trains like a thoroughbred will beat the thoroughbred who trains like a plow horse every day. And you see that played out in life. And I think there's this misconception like, oh, well, I wasn't born into this type of family or they have other advantages. And certainly that is, is true. However, then I just think of Oprah Winfrey, who comes from a deplorable place. And she's spoken openly about a horrible childhood. And you look at her now, she's a billionaire. She's Oprah Winfrey. So I think anytime people are more invested in their excuses than their possibilities, you know, you have to be invested in your possibilities and what's true for you and stay in your own lane. That's my, my thing. My biggest takeaway from swimming, swim your own race. Everyone's so concerned with what everyone else is doing. And then you just throw in the towel and say, well, screw it. I don't have her looks. I don't have his money. I don't have their education. Uh, and then you go back to your bad habits. So you know, it is a level of showing up and, and, and believing in yourself. Come on, let's go. Fantastic. I mean, swimming has become like a metaphor for wider life, both in my journey and for you, it sounds like. Um, <clears throat> I'm keen about the whole mentoring aspect of this because you gave an example of Phil Jackson in the book, you know, arguably what, the most famous basketball coach of all time. Who else along your way, whether it's in sport or the, the other aspects of your life, has kind of been that person who's passed on these messages to you and kind of, yeah, shown you the way? Certainly my, my swim coach, Larry, who I just mentioned, and he, he was like Phil Jackson and that he, he was pretty Zen. He wouldn't get fired up too much when he did, you knew, you know, there was really something, but, um, I think with what Larry did with what Phil Jackson does is that that mentality of, you know, there's so much more to life than basketball or swimming, but more importantly, there's more to basketball or swimming than basketball or swimming. And, and that is that inner journey and that showing up for your teammate and having a purpose greater than yourself. I also had a, a friend of mine, Marianne, who's written some of my favorite books and she really got me in touch with my spirit and thinking in those terms. And um, I think just any author or someone who's doing the work that you can study and let it inspire you. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've done the research with the Stoics and all those sort of people, but I think, you know, children, my, my niece is a mentor to me. She's so present. And when I'm distracted, she calls me out and it's like, hello, I'm here. What is more important than my cute, perfect face? And I think children and animals and, and nature, na it sounds funny, but nature is a huge mentor of mine because, you know, this, I talk about this in the book too. The sun isn't up there. Like, oh, am I like cooler than the clouds or 
oh gosh, is the rainbow going to get more likes than me? It's just, it's not concerned with any of the elements. The grass isn't worried about how fast it's growing. It just does. The, the flowers aren't in competition with the other flowers or thinking I need to bloom faster, be more beautiful. And so again, as I'm saying it, it sounds silly and ridiculous, but I do just go outside and immerse myself in nature because a it's calming, but B, if you just look around, you see how perfect everything is. And it's, nothing is trying to be perfect or to do anything. It just is. And we're like that too, but we just, we don't believe that. We think that there's always something wrong with us and we don't measure up. And that's because we're bombarded with those messages in our society. One of my um, favorite activities away from podcasting and everything else is to go surfing because it's one of those sports where I feel like you would be doing something that a thousand years ago wouldn't look too much different to what it does now. And it feels like one of those sanctuaries that you can actually get away from the noise and the clutter and the judgment and actually just be, just do what you want to do and enjoy it. Yeah. And surfing, as you know, you have to be so, so present or you're going to, you're, you're, you could die, you know? I mean, so it does, it forces you to be present in your body and, and with the water and really working with it um, rather than against it. I'm curious as to now, now that the, the book's out there and you, you've got all those thoughts out and experiences and actually created it. What does it mean to you to now have something that you know is going to have these ripple effects to people around the world who are up against these challenges and trying to find the true north on their compass and they go, here you go, here's a tool that's actually going to help you. What does that feel like? Oh gosh, well, oh, it kind of gives me the chills. It doesn't even seem real yet because I've worked on this whole project for years and and wrote and edited all of it during this past year of COVID. And so it's just been isolation on top of isolation. I feel like I live in this vacuum and it's, it is kind of like, oh, wait a minute, like this is real. This is happening. It's out in the world. And so, you know, I don't have children. So this is, this is my, my legacy. This is um, a gift. I feel like we can give to ourselves again and again. And I just hope people have fun with it and, and, and make spiritual fitness a part of their lives. And really, like you said, a ripple effect to not just help themselves, but their families and their communities and have it spread out into the world so that, that this, this elevates the world. And this is, this is their, our default setting rather than the doom and gloom and hatred and, and anxiety and stress and overwhelm and exhaustion that we're, we're flipping that up on its head. And it, I don't think it's even, <laughs> I don't think it's even fully hit me yet. And, and also there's that, I mean, I share a lot of things that very vulnerable things that really hard probably a couple of people at best know about me. So it is that vulnerability thing, but I've just, I'm past that because it's, this is a bigger cause. So you have to put yourself and your, your self-consciousness and your own feelings aside and just be like this, this project's for the, the greater good. You talked a minute ago about your niece being a role model as being somebody who is completely present all the time. So if you could go back to your childhood and give a message to yourself, what would it be? Mm. You know, I would, I would tell her to not be so hard on herself. And I wish, you know, we have tools now as adults that we don't have then. Um, and it's all part of the journey, but I wish that she could, or I would say to her, you know, Kate, I wish you could let yourself off the hook a bit more and just, you know, trust in yourself, trust in the process. I I always have a lot of fun, but I would say, don't forget to have fun. That's what we're meant to do. But I think it is that message of, keep going and, um, don't worry about what anybody says. Your thoughts and feelings are the only ones that truly matter. And girl, you're a rock star. Like just, I don't know. You just, you want to just tell people, I think if I had kids, you don't want to just tell them to enjoy life because even at that age, there's at 18, it's what college are you getting into and what's your SAT score and what are, what's your GPA and are you the state champion? Did you make Olympic trials? You know, are you cute enough? Do you haven't like, do boys like you do girls? Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of sickening. So I would just, I guess the overall message, sorry, I'm rambling, but it's like, just have fun girl and, and keep going, you know, do what makes you happy and, 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 and forget all the other noise and nonsense. You know, it's wonderful. Uh, it's a very wide range of guests that I have the pleasure of interviewing and Back in uh, one of our previous seasons, we interviewed a lady called Kath, who was a triple Olympian, Olympic medalist. 
And I asked her the same question. And having been on a very different journey, she ended up as a diplomat working in war zones after her Olympic experience. And she said, if I could go back and speak to my younger self, enjoy the journey, enjoy the experience, be the best version of yourself. Don't worry about all the external noise. And I just think it's fascinating to talk to people from different parts of the world in different careers. And they're saying the same thing. If you want ultimate happiness, don't worry about what everyone else thinks. Isn't that amazing? Thank you so much for sharing that. And it does, it gets me emotional because you just think of this life where we have so much pressure and so much, so many expectations and so much stress and none of it means anything, especially if this is, you know, your last day or your last week, it's like, how do you want to go out? And so, yeah, we all have to work. Yeah. We all have responsibilities, but have fun with it. I mean, like this podcast, it's, it's so much fun. And because we're just being real. So I think that's the message too. just be real, be authentically who you need to be, not who your parents say, or society says, or what you think you need to be doing to be deemed as worthy. But what do you, what do you want? I think that's what I, every 18, what do you really want? And you only you. Fantastic. Well, that's a nice message to put it all together. It really, I've really enjoyed it. It's been so bubbly and exciting and it's kind of everything I've read out of the book has been brought to life. It's out this week so everyone can go out and get it. Links we've made sure we've included in the show notes. And I'm also going to include the link to your website because some of the blog articles on there, again, really interesting and just bring some of those anecdotal stories to life a little bit more. So thank you so much, Kate, for sharing your time. It's been brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. A huge thanks again there to Kate for sharing some time with us. You can check out Kate's book, which is linked in the show notes, as well as her website, which is packed with useful tips to help you on your journey. If you're an Instagrammer, make sure you give our podcast a follow as we're going to be doing another live show next week. And please don't forget, whatever platform you're joining us on, please make sure you give us a quick review and click subscribe. Next week, we're extremely excited to be welcoming Hugo Tagholm, Chief Executive at Surfers Against Sewage, the ocean conservation charity that takes action from the beach all the way through to parliamentary groups. Make sure you join us for that, and thank you again for joining us for another episode of the Road Monkey Podcast.